Talking Radio. Hello and welcome to another edition of Talking Radio. Today we are chatting to a man best known for his years on the Radio 1 Roadshow. And in fact, you might notice behind us, we're sitting outside, there is a huge great sign from the first ever Radio 1 Roadshow, July 1973, 44 years ago, in New Quay in Cornwall, that first ever Radio 1 Roadshow. And the man who helped make it happen, Tony Miles. Smiley Miley, welcome to Talking Radio. Thank you very much and you're welcome. So, how did it all begin? Johnny Beerling came up with the idea for the Roadshow and then you were the man who made it happen. How did you get involved? Well, Johnny, Johnny Beerling uh, was on holiday in the south of France and he was on a camping holiday with his family and he seen this little 10 foot um, trailer, which is, I think it was Monte Carlo Radio, were playing to the, the holiday maker. He came back to Radio 1, had a meeting and said, uh, they were, at that time they were doing um, lunchtime gigs in clubs. Um, and it was, it's done its course. And he said, look, why can't we take this? Does anybody know how that can happen? And uh, a dear friend um, of my brother's, Brian Patton, producer in Bristol, he was at this meeting. He said, I know a man. He manages <laughs> the Wurzels and he has a, a furniture van, which is a mobile stage. Well, Johnny Beard said, go and see if he can hire it from him. Brian contacted my brother and John said, sadly, we've just scrapped it. <laughs> But what do you want to do? So John said, hmm. So I've been in the motor trade. We had our own body repair business. And John said to me, the BBC wanted I said, well, why don't we build it? <laughs> so we went back to them and they came down to Bristol at John's office. They rode it out basically on the back of a, a cigarette packet. And uh, they only wanted it 10 foot. And Miles is, we don't do anything small. So <laughs> we made it, why? 18 foot six long. Do you know what I mean? Had no idea, didn't know. And I... Um, I never towed trailers in my life. So the BBC said, well, if you build it, would your brother tow it around for us? Um, and we didn't know how much to charge. And, you know, if I told you how much, and I wouldn't now, it was peanuts. It wouldn't buy a round of drinks in the pub. Uh, but we took it on and uh, we built it. And I have to say is that um, the first, uh, they rigged it out in BBC in Bristol, in the transport uh, yeah. department there. Um, so Bristol played a very big part in the starting of the Radio 1 Roadshow. The vehicle was built in Bristol. It was started with the, the producer uh, of the first Roadshow was Brian Patton, and, and it was rigged there. And uh, while the, the, um, the engineers put all the wiring in, uh, we had to do a dummy run, and uh, Alan Freeman was going to open the show in Newquay um, on July the 27th, 1973, and uh, I had to then take this, this trailer with all the equipment to uh, Witcher of an old aircraft hangar, and uh, the BBC um, uh, personnel, they reacted and said, you can't put all that equipment in there, it'd be overweight, so um, we're committed now, I don't know what weight's got to be put in it, and... Uh, the engineers, they had these great big three foot by two foot orange speakers and they were ginormous. And you'd have, you'd have a little, you'd do it out your iPad now, yeah. the size of those speakers. So we, um, uh, we had to uh, get a van, put it all in there. So anyway, we took it with what was in the trailer and what was in the, uh, the, the van. Anyway, we set it all up and it worked. And Freeman, Alan Freeman was there and he loved it. And we come to the end and we packed everything into the trailer. It didn't go into another van. And, and I thought, oh, my God. Anyway, I set off, and I think this was like Thursday. And they said, we'll see you in New Quay on Sunday. <laughs> Hey-ho, I set off. I got five miles down the road. Um, I was only a mile away from my brothers. And I got there, and I said, I can't do it. He said, don't be so stupid. I said, I can't control it. I can't go over 20 miles an hour. So he said, what do you, I said, what do I do? And he said, well, why don't you bring one of your mates in the breakdown? So I rang a guy called Robin Harris, and I said, what do I do? i got this deal to do. He said, bang the tyre pressures up to 60 pounds, and that'll help you keep in a straight line. But what it did do, James, is that um, by putting the pressure up on these tyres, they would get so hot, and they'd blow out. <laughs> I didn't even blow the tyres out. I blew the bloody rims off. <laughs> At that first road show, July 73, Fluff Freeman opened it, all of that. Did you know immediately 
this works? Well, it took me eight hours to drive from Clifton uh, to Newquay. Eight hours, uh, and now with the motor, there was no motorways. Um, is that I arrived in Newquay. Um, we set it up on the Monday. Uh, one of the biggest things is the BBC engineers hadn't allowed for how far they had to bring a mains cable. Uh, they didn't have enough mains cable, so they had to go back to Plymouth to get it. Anyway, we got on the air, and the minute we finished... That one programme on that Monday afternoon in Newquay, uh, Johnny Beerling was saying, everybody was saying, this is a fantastic, this is the way Radio 1 goes out on the summer holidays. This is how we go to the public. And ever since 1973, every radio station, every TV station have got a road show. That is what you do. You take your front out to the people. And uh, it went on. The worst thing was the first uh, the first year of the road show. We did the road show from 4 o'clock to 5.30. Well, that meant everybody had been in the pubs, on the sherbet, <laughs> <laughs> and there they were. And there Alan we, Freeman as well? well? I don't know about Freeman. <laughs> I don't know about Fluff. <laughs> he, went on, he went on sherbet. He went drinking. <laughs> he, was, he was fantastic. He would be there in the morning when we were rigging. And, and we just took a, a sort of a... A lazy time because mm. four o'clock, you know, we'd have breakfast, Monday down. Anyway, we had our problems the first year because the road show from four o'clock to five thirty. Then we had to pack up. Then you had to travel, um, and no one worked out the travelling for me. Uh, they booked parking that someone would be around at nine o'clock. I never got to the, the next destination to midnight. I then had to find a hotel. I then had to eat, eat, and then I had to party. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, how did the whole Smiley Miley brand come about? Because, you know, you're helping out, you're helping make it happen, all of that. But how did you become such a big on-air presence that, that everyone who turned up at the roadshow knew about? How long did that take? Oh, well, from day one. Mm. Uh, I, it was... Um, I've been in the motor trade. I, I was, what, uh, uh, 26 uh, when I started the roadshow. Um, and I've been a young motor trade. started when I was 20 with my brother... Uh, at a body repair business in Bristol, and we we set this set off to do this, um, and I turned up in uh, in Newquay, um, and the BBC said um, we want to do bits and pieces, guess uh, the the artists and the record, and we want to guess, and I knew nothing about it, and uh, I did. You know, I got a very strong Bristolian accent, and I thought, okay. And they stuck a microphone. How many miles? Uh, Tony Miles in the first year, and I said, there. Went, how have you got there? So I did it. You know, didn't know how I got there. Um, anyway, that happened first year, and it was a. And then the second year, um, I went to a meeting, uh, a pre pre briefing meeting, about a week before the road show, and. Uh, I got there and we're sat in the uh, broadcasting house around the, the big uh, oval table and uh, they started playing these jingles, you know, and they said, uh, um, uh, 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 and also is, is that um, the, in 1974, uh, my brother and myself, we took on the merchandise. So we produced a, a, a caravan called the Radio 1 Goody Mobile. And so that's how the merchandise carried on. So I sat down there and they played a jingle and said, check out the 247 Goody Mobile with Smiley Miley. And I went, it, we, we, it, we do the merchandise. And they said, no, no, that's you. <laughs> Me, Smiley Miley. What do you mean? Miles, smiles, you know? So that's how it did. <laughs> <laughs> and was there ever a point where you became such a kind of household name, such a fixture on the road show that you thought, go on, give me a regular show in the week as well. Let me, you know, make your proper DJ. Did you ever want to do that or was it just about the road shows for you? No, I mean... Um, uh, no, I mean, I wasn't into music. I, when I was very young, I was about uh, 17, 18, um, I, I, I started to play the bass guitar and there was three of us, Beatles days or whatever. We all thought we could be, you know, in the bands or yeah. whatever. But no, I mean, it grew and grew. And the thing was, James, is that this about me appearing every day to do the Smiley Miley mileage and then I would be used to do a little bit of intro, go out there and I was mucking around and I thought, how do I keep this going up? Day in, nine, nine weeks every day to appear. Mm. Um, so I started to muck around. I was the practical Dennis the Menace. So, like you, you know, <laughs> you're becoming one of me. Do you know what I mean? 
<laughs> keep it up. Yeah, you're learning. <laughs> and and so I started to do silly pranks, silly stunts, and they started off tame, and everybody did it. You know, DLT would put a stink bomb <laughs> under your toilet seat and all that, and all that thing, cling film over your loo when you went to the loo. You had a shower back in your face, all those type of things. Those were tame and whatever. But I started to get bigger and bigger, and some of my well-documented uh, stunts is that I swapped my, I stole Mike Reed's guitar when we were in St. Austell. <laughs> and uh, I got the police on board and said, look, you know, um, I'm going to steal his guitar um, and uh, he's going to think it's me, but, you know, it's not. Um, I've got another guitar I'm going to give him, which has got um, electronic charge in it, which has got a, a smoke bomb. And uh, they said, OK. Um, we'll go along with it as long as we don't have a murder. <laughs> so, no, so it, it's a murder or a stunt. You know what I mean, <laughs> you know, it's all about midnight summer's dreams. You know what I mean, God blimey. Um, so he said, uh, I've had my guitar stolen. I thought it was Smiley Miley, but the police reckon that they seen someone jumping on a motorbike. So I said, Oh God. Anyway, I, I then convinced Mike Reed that I've got a guitar from Kid Creole and Coconut, and I've still got the guitar here now. And uh, so Reed, he goes on, he's playing this guitar, and everybody is saying, shut up, shut up. And everybody knew what I was going to do. And I sat in the audience with this radio controlled, and I froze, and I couldn't do it. And I thought, and I finally pressed a button, and the guitar got red hot, smoke come out. <laughs> There's the result. I shut up Mike Reed for five minutes. He didn't know what was happening, you know. And uh, so that was uh, that was very big. But one one thing I learned from doing the road show, uh, we had the pictures, but we had no video. And mm. every TV station, every bleepers wants that video. So yeah. from then on, there and the stunts got bigger and bigger. I uh, I nicked Mike Reed's MGB and dropped it in the in the lake at Cleethorpes. Um, I also uh, he he got me back as well. So it was <laughs> one there from crabs in the bed and got my uh, Range Rover all bricked up. And one of the big ones was that um, he uh, he turned up at the the road show um, at Peter Powell's in Torquay. And I said to him, Why don't you dress up as a policeman and go and arrest Peter Powell? <laughs> So he said, oh, great. So he got there, he got a helmet, I got the police on board. So Reed, he goes on stage, and he's there talking, and the police go on stage and arrest Mike Reed for real, and again... For impersonating a police officer. For impersonating a police, <laughs> policeman uh, there. That is the front page of The Sun in 1986, <laughs> is that they handcuffed him, put him in a squad car... <laughs> Put him in the police station, did his fingerprints, and he was sat in a jail with another prisoner, and the prisoner said, you might read. He said, yeah. He said, I haven't missed the roadshow, have I? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the other person who was in a cell with him really wanted to go to the roadshow. And show. he met him. And he met him. <laughs> in the end, all the press from London were ringing the police station. It was so hot. Uh, this stunt is that the superintendent felt he had to release Mike Reed. <laughs> so Mike Reed, only way he could get out, he was wearing a Radio 1 uh, staff T-shirt. He had to give it. So they let him out with no no shirt on. <laughs> he had to walk the streets of Torquay. Um, but the stunts got bigger and bigger. And I was always told that uh, um, to stop. Uh, controllers of Radio 1, Derek... Uh, Chinnery, who uh, is no longer with us, and he said, Smiley, someone's going to get hurt if you carry on. But he said, uh, I know you're not going to, but all I can say is make sure that every stunt you do is bigger than the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned Mike, and we did speak to him, and he was great when he spoke to us, and, and clearly he loved the road show, and there were certain jocks who loved the road show and kind of thrived in the environment, and others who, I think Simon Bates said, he never quite found his feet on it. Who were the ones who absolutely were in their element and who are the ones who struggled a bit well I mean just talking about Simon Simon is um, a great broadcaster and he loved the studio environment mm. he would love to do that interview um, and, and really you know I was uh, um, the ruler if you want to say that everybody had to whether you're an artist or whatever you had to wear shorts <laughs> um, and if you didn't it's like Jason Donovan turned up in Glasgow at a road show he had lovely white designer sh jeans on. I cut them off. <laughs> you know, it made the front page. I said, I told you. 
Yeah. So that, that, there. So Simon didn't want really to dress up or whatever. Mm. Simon would have been quite happy if he just walked out on stage in a suit. Yeah. Um, but Simon did get into it. Um, the great ones from early days was the likes of, you know, we had an A team, B team and C team. Yeah. Um, right from the beginning, uh, the likes of uh, Alan Freeman, Noel Edmonds, DLT, um, Ed Stewart, Roscoe. Um, they were, you know, David Hamilton. That was who started the road show. And I think that... They had. They come from uh, pirate radio. They knew how to work that audio. They were showmen. Really. Uh, they were showmen. Yeah. And and really, right up to you know to the nineties, Radio One was celebrity radio, yeah. no question about it. Um, and then when Radio One changed you know, their format, um, it was back to back music. So they lost. And I think all radio stations need to be uh, whether you're a local radio station, you've got to make those DJs broadcasters that what people want to listen you can play the record but it's the bit in between mm. uh, when like Gary Davis he would hype them for a bit in the middle and he'd have everybody doing keep fit on there um, Steve Wright he would he would bring his posse um, <laughs> and Steve always had his posse Richard uh, Easter was always Richard there Richard Easter there stage, uh, yeah. Peter Dixon yeah. the voice of, of like X Factor and yeah. there and we play when there we had a tank of fish and you had to put someone in it um, we'd make all that that, that would all happen and it it was what people wanted mm. uh, what the audience wanted and they try to it they come and and when I when I say that we had audiences of from 20 to 30 to 40,000 people on Western Beach and they came for a free show and they would hold up their board say hello to mum my sister or auntie um, uh, guys want to just name check there there and talk about name checks if we said to a hotel and uh, on air and we weren't too cool we're thirsty wouldn't mind a bit of sherbet you know <laughs> Within 10 minutes, there was a silver solver with a bottle of champagne, yeah. you know, um, or whatever. And, and it, you know, the road show, um, a lot of people would say in its past, it was the bucket and spade routine on the pier. But was that a bad thing? It, it was magnificent. And I feel very proud that I was able to be part, and it's history now, of something which started um, which nobody knew what was going to happen. And now here we are, 44 years later, um, the roadshow. Uh, Radio 1 went on to do big weekends, uh, big fun days. Where what do you make of those? I mean, they're, they are impressive events, but they're very different. They're not the roadshow. No, and I suppose, you know, and, you know, back in 74, 75, the BBC were worried about how strong we were making Radio 1. And Radio 1 was you could have said, could have become commercial. Uh, Radio 1 could have been sold off. Um, we were hoping it would. <laughs> we would it was have almost a victim of his own success. Yeah, it, it, it was doing so well that... It, it was doing so well, and the audience there, but what the BBC then did is brought uh, Matthew Bannister in and wanted to get rid of all the hardcore and just wanted to play back-to-back -back music for 15, 18-year-olds, which you could get on any other radio station. But they wanted to do that. They didn't care when they lost millions of people. You know, when 15 million people were listening to Radio 1. Um, and that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and when, you know, when you talk about the road show, is that we had, uh, and it was the biggest road show in the world, and I make no question about it. I, I, I question if any other road, uh, radio station could do what we'd done. It was a business for me, but it was very hard. You know, up at six o'clock in the morning, and we yeah. probably didn't get to bed till five o'clock. Wow. <laughs> we had an hour of sleep. Um, you know, but we, we, we enjoyed ourselves. We partied. It was tiring, but the adrenaline of it for everybody, from the DJ, producer, and, it, and in the early days, there might have been half a dozen people make the roadshow work. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, when the when Radio One built the the Mark IV, the the forty foot Arctic and the support vehicle, a quarter of a million pound rig, um, that was phenomenal. But with the st uh, with um, uh, 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 top staging where the artists could sit on, go up on the top and play, um, and that was playing. The What's play happened to them all now? All the vehicles. Well, the vehicle which um, we uh, um, we built in nineteen seventy three uh, that passed over in seventy six to Radio Lollipop in Bristol. Um, I think what the Mark Three is sat in a car park down in Devon, looking very sad. Uh, Mark Four is somewhere in the UK. I'd love to get my hands on it. Um, you know, props. Revive the roadshow. Not the Radio One roadshow. <laughs> <laughs> 
you you know, you can come, you know. Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> Having Hanson on the road, you oh, my God. You know, we know what it's like when you're on a Sunday morning, you know, trying, trying to get... <laughs> Try to get, uh, try to beat Sasha and Mar- Martin. Well, I tell you what, on the Sunday mornings, my partner in crime Sunday mornings, Andy, of course, is the other half of Talking Radio, and he's floating about doing the cameras, and he always asks an off mic question. What's your question, Andy? I'm not Mike, I'm Smiley. <laughs> ah. um, I want a Steve Wright or Simon Mayo story that we would never have heard before. Um, Preferably Steve Wright would be great. All right, I'll tell you a story. It's like Jack and Ori, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the problem is, Andy, there is so many stories um, I could talk about Steve. Uh, let me tell you, um, it might have been aired on Radio 1. One night, <laughs> Steve had to be entertained. He was fidget. He, you know, I love him dearly. And uh, Steve, your Radio 2 show is fantastic. Radio 1 should have had capital gold and you should have still been there. But the story with Steve is that we were in Clacton and uh, he stayed, and lots of times he would uh, drive back to London, but we managed to make him stay with us in Clacton. And we were staying at the Geisha Hotel. And I had a room there and they had a lo- lovely porcelain plant, Smiley's room, you know. <laughs> so I had my own room there. Anyway, we were there and we used to play, uh, all, all the team would sit there and we put a pound on there and uh, if you turned your card up, you were out there. And it was a game of, you know, you, no big uh, gambling. Anyway, Steve would like to have a side bet. And he'd say, shuffle the cards, take a card. So if I had a higher card than him, I would take it, see? So, okay, it was going on and it started very tame. So he said, and he wanted to raise it. And he said, uh, uh, a weekend a weekend in, uh, in the UK uh, for you and your wife. Um, I said, OK. So if I lost, I had to, do, I had to buy him and Cindy, his wife, uh, who was married to then there. And I win it. Oh, I've got a weekend. <laughs> so he thinks, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be beaten. So he goes on and he says, right, he had an old car. And I got, I got a six-wheel Range Rover outside with a Radio 1 caravan. He said, well... I'll put my car keys in. So I put my car keys in. <laughs> so we flipped the key and I win again. You know, is this luck? I hope you're listening, Andy. Is that so I win, I've got weekend, I've got his car keys. So then he goes, he says, I'll step it up. He's hoping that I back out. And he said, A weekend in New York. Okay. So I've already got if I lose, I lose everything. Yeah. So it's just keep going, it's rolling. So um, it goes then, so we turn it. I win the weekend. I win the weekend in New York for my wife and myself. And I said, do I get any spending money? Not in this, right? <laughs> so he said, and this is the ultimate, and I just, I don't feel good about it. <laughs> he said, right, his son was Tommy, I think, um, and my son James. He said, my son in and your son <laughs> <laughs> Child support listening. Uh, so I said, okay, and I win. I win his son, holiday to New York. I got his car keys. And, and I'm saying, that's it. And everybody's shouting. We got an audience in this hotel. It's at dinner time, you know, in the evening. And every, the whole place is erupting. Do you know what I mean? And I'm saying, I've had enough now. They said, you can. I said, well, there's got to be. And he said, one more. <laughs> I don't know what the last one. I'd lost it by then. <laughs> and so he turns the cards over, and the ultimate, it, I had to go on. I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't own his son in, in his car. <laughs> for, you know, uh, how did he ring his son uh, and say, uh, you know, Smiley owns you now? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he got everything back. Um, but there's, there's stories about all of them, you know. Now, sitting beside us throughout the interview, we've had these... Radio 1 Vintage Roadshow Bomber Jackets. Well, it all started off back in uh, with uh, a guy by the name of uh, John Knowles who had a um, uh, clothes factory and he ended up managing uh, um, Gary Davis and has got his own uh, agency now with many of the artists. Um, and he was making bomber jackets. I was probably uh, instrumental uh, 
uh, of making them all wear it because I knew the publicity it would. Uh, but um, I would be out on the road and uh, dear John, my brother, would be back holding all the reins, keeping it, uh, keeping it all, getting the stock all ordered. We didn't know what we were going to sell. Um, we did umbrellas, we did poly ponchos. You know, if the, if the weather changed, uh, we wouldn't sell many T-shirts, but we sell thousands <laughs> of plastic poly ponchos. Um, and it's known in that he would have to set out in the West Country to come in, uh, restock with umbrellas. Um, we had... 150 items of Radio 1, and then we had mail order, we used to do Radio 1 calendar, we're the only, the only people, and the only company ever to advertise on Radio 1, uh, to buy a Radio 1 calendar from <laughs> P.O. Box 247 Z. Um, so though, I mean, there's so much we could go on, and yeah. uh, um, I hope that, uh, I've got 50,000 pictures, um, and everybody asked me to, to do a book, and I suppose, um, I ought to sit down and try. To, there is so much, and I know the artists, the DJs. Um, wherever we go, we get asked about what the roadshow is, mm. and it's living history now. It is. Well, look, Tony, thank you so much for talking to us about it. Not today. at all. You're you are a living legend. No, it? I'm not. And if ever you bring bring back the you know the bus and do anything, it's not a bus. I mean, you yeah. know, sorry, you know what I mean. Yeah. Then, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, it's is that um, who knows what's in front of us. Uh, but I think that we're privileged, of, you know, all of us, and we have the members. I know many DJs have all moved on and whatever. We've all got older. I'm not saying that we're going to be, we could be tramping around in shorts and whatever. But I don't know. Is that, um, I don't know. Long live the Radio 1 Roadshow. And the response we have from social media and everything about the Radio 1 Roadshow. Um, Radio 1 is in a different there now yeah. with Nick Grimshaws and that and they do, you know, the big festivals um, and Radio 1 is very great, great coverage of uh, of Glastonbury's mm. but that's not Radio 1, that's Radio 1 covering it and what you're going to remember is this was us in a vehicle going to meet and this was Radio 1's PR um, and there's no finer PR you can have is to go and meet your people. Absolutely not. Tony, it's been an absolute pleasure. And Thank can you I very just much. say to you is keep being Dennis the Menace. <laughs> I'll try. And keep looking over your shoulder because <laughs> as Mike Rusey says, he never knows when we might be around. Talking Radio.